So there are currently, you know, half a dozen Al Jazeera journalists, producers, cameramen in jail. Um, some of them have been there for over six months. Abdullah Shami is on hunger strike. He's in critical condition. He's lost at least like 40 pounds if you look at his images. Um, another one of our fellow uh, colleagues had a broken arm or problems with his arm and he wasn't given attention. So their situation isn't very um, optimistic. I wouldn't say that the Egyptian government is going to bow down to any campaigns to free AJ staff, which is a campaign that's global now, mm -hmm. because it is about sending a message, not just to Al Jazeera, but to any media organization locally and outside of the country, that we will not tolerate um, any actions that make us look bad. Peter Greste, who's one of the Australian, is Australian in jail, he wrote a letter, and in it he has a quote which says more or less that if you, um, our arrest has served as a chilling warning to others, if you basically do what the state says, then you are deserving of liberty. But if you don't, then you are a threat that must be crushed. Um, so it is a message, and I actually believe that the more intense the campaign is, the less likely it is that the government will let them go. Um, their last trial, I think, on World Press Freedom Day, Hamad Fahmi actually told the judge, you know, that this is World Press Freedom Day, and the judge actually said, what said, oh, happy World Press Freedom Day, and then sent them back to the dock, which was very ironic. Um, so yeah, so it is a message. It's not just because they're Al Jazeera, it's because they're journalists. And I think it speaks a lot about the state of journalism in Egypt today and how we look at it. Mm -hmm. Al Jazeera has been thoroughly demonized in Egyptian society. Our media narrative um, changes very rapidly from, you know, someone's a hero to someone's a devil. Mm -hmm. And Al Jazeera is currently the devil for supporting the Muslim Brotherhood or for their biased reporting in some instances. Um, that This means, because of the polarization of Egyptian society, now the narrative is you're either with CC or you hate Egypt and you want the terrorists to win, who is now the Muslim Brotherhood. People who were in power last year have now become the terrorists and the enemy and kind of like you're either, which was the narrative back then, you're either with Mursi or you're an infidel. So there's no middle ground here. So journalism, especially Al Jazeera, is very, very, very thoroughly hated in Egypt now. But I would actually say this is a wider problem of how we look at journalists. Egypt is now one of the most dangerous places to be a journalist. According, you know, to the Committee to Protect Journalists, just in the last six, seven months, you've had half a dozen killed, you know, like a lot detained, assaulted, sexually harassed, media organizations raided. So it's across the board. And according to Freedom House, we were, a couple of years ago, we were partly free when it comes to media freedoms. We are now classified as not free because of campaigns, you know, to intimidate journalists, to prosecute them. Bessem Youssef was a huge case, you know, and he had um, complaints filed against him. So it's across the board and extra bad when it comes to Al Jazeera. Just let me say that any news, any news organization, independent, state-owned, there will always be bias. There will always be someone from above, someone who has the money, someone who has the power. There will always be a direction, no matter how objective you try. There will also be personal interests. The best journalists I know have still their own beliefs, which they try their best not to let filter through, but sometimes, no matter how carefully they do. So I don't believe there's any news organization in the world, no matter what history they have, no matter how powerful, how influential they have, that isn't, that is 100% free from bias. That said, I have worked in a variety of news organizations. I worked for CNN, I worked for MSNBC, I've worked for Foreign Policy, I've done a lot of stuff, and what I've come to believe is that you, as a journalist, are responsible for your work, and that you have your fights with your editor whenever there's problems over a story or a certain whether it came to the Palestinian Intifada, do we use the word martyr or do we use the word suicide bomber? All these tiny little things journalists always have to work through. So of course one of the biggest issues with last year was, was it a coup or was it a revolution in Egypt? This is a huge word. And I think to, I'll, I'll get to your question, but one of the biggest uh, uproars happened in Egypt at the time when the first people, CNN, called it a coup. And just to show, to highlight that it isn't just, the anger wasn't just directed at Al Jazeera. It was directed at all foreign media who classified the ouster of President Morsi as a coup. If you had looked at, oh my god, I got so many messages, please send this to CNN, you're always on them, tell them that this is wrong, this is a people's revolution, they shouldn't tell the world that this is a coup, we love our military, the military only listen to us, etc., etc. 
So it's not just Al Jazeera that is considered biased. Any foreign media which reported at the time that it was a coup was considered biased. And again, that always goes back to how do you as an individual frame a certain event and how does this media then fall in line with what you see or not. And that's how your perceptions are, are created. So if Al Jazeera had said that this was you know, people's revolution, and thank God the military is out, they would have been applauded, which is what happened back in Morsi's time, because when Morsi won and Al Jazeera was covering it, oh my God, Al Jazeera is so good, they're saying that you know we've had democracy, because their line of thought was following what was happening on the ground at the time. So I actually believe everything fluctuates. Um, and I believe that what's considered an enemy today could be considered the, the hero tomorrow. And that's actually, to reflect the events in Egypt, that's kind of what's happening, right? You had, we love Mubarak, we hate Mubarak, we love the army, we hate the army, we love Morsi, we hate Morsi, we love the army. And you never know what could happen next year. Mm -hmm. So I will not say that some of the Al Jazeera's coverage has been unbiased. It definitely has been biased in some instances. But again, I cannot um, judge for a channel or any news organization what they work do. I can only judge the individual work of the journalists. And what I can actually say is that for me, Al Jazeera English is actually one of the most professional channels I've had the, the honor of um, working with, and which is not a lot. But and the journalists who actually are in jail, which is pretty ironic, actually work for Al Jazeera English, not Al Jazeera Arabic, which is the accused of the bias. Um, so that is unfortunate. Um, but again, yeah, just to summarize, I feel every news organization has its bias. Some are just more, are better at hiding it than others. And the people's perception of this coverage is, it matters very much when we come to classify is this channel a good channel or a bad channel. It depends on how they're covering the events. So next year Al Jazeera could be a hero again. You never know. Oh yeah, for sure. Like there are very contradictory articles when it comes to media. So you have an article that says, you know, freedom of expression is guaranteed. And then you have another one that says, but there will be punishment if you insult the prophets. There's one that talks about how um, their press is free, but Judicial oversight isn't necessary if, you, if an employee is proven to have insulted a state operative. So there's, there's a lot of little wordings and a lot of vague and ambiguous things which actually don't make the situation better. Even the emergency law, which is part of the reason we had a revolution in the first place, when SCAF came in, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, they actually increased the things that were against the media. Um, they appointed, you know, like the censorship and a new information minister, all these, all the actions that have taken place when it comes to media in the last two years, whether under Morsi or under the military, were worse. Actually, under, under Morsi, more um, journalists were arrested in the latter half of his rule than in the entire 18 months that SCAF was previously in charge. The blasphemy more than one, whether it was you had Najib Sawiris, the businessman, you had a blogger who posted a link to a trailer about um, a movie that was against Islam. You had so many stories, you know, intimidation. Of it. You had Morsi allowed the then uh, Islamist council to appoint new editors for the state-owned paper. So all the actions when it came to media were negative under both situations. So it's not, you can't even say that under the army things were bad and under the Muslim Brotherhood they were better. They were bad in all situations. So even though we were supposed to have a freedom of information bill or law and it kept being debated in 2012 and that never materialized. And, that, and I doubt it will materialize anytime soon under the pretext of national security. You had um, Sisi who was expected to be president by next this time next week. Mm -hmm. um, he had a meeting with around 20 editors of the largest newspapers and he kept reiterating how much they shouldn't you know, spread unease or unrest, that they should stay away from any information that will cause havoc or problems at this particular juncture in time and kept repeating that over and over again. Um, so I don't think the media landscape is any better. Um, it's actually become a lot more polarized, even more so, and that actually any even attempt at objective journalism has decreased in private media, which is even more. Before, we used to say, well, it's state media, you know, state media always cheers for the leader. But now even private media is doing the same, and even more so. TV hosts in Egypt are a phenomenon in and of itself. They're many celebrities, one, one, one right? So they have their own following. They have their own 
It's as if this talk show of theirs is their own private living room, and they are free to say whatever they want. There's absolutely no、um, judgment or any kind of shock at what they say. I remember watching. Um, one of the hosts, when the, the decree of the 529 men were sentenced to death,、mm-hmm. and he was saying how I wish they were 10,000, I wish they were 20,000. They all deserve to die. It's just shocking. You're like you're a news anchor. You're not. It's this isn't like a column you're writing in a paper, which is clearly an editorial. And even then, if someone wrote that in a paper, they would get responses like, "Oh my God, how can you feature someone who is totally not even trying to be objective in any way?" So. It's not just because they have the money. It's because the way we look at journalism in Egypt has shifted so drastically. It's no, no one's listening to be to get the news. They're listening or the facts. They're listening to reaffirm whatever it is they think or they want to believe. And it's become so commonly accepted that that you're just not even shocked anymore. You're just yeah, of course. So to give you an example, when Sisi announced that he would run for president、um, the day March 26th,、um, state media actually aired a little documentary on Hamdine Sabahi, who is the opposing candidate. My own personal interpretation is they did this in order to get it out of the way, right? Okay, see, we we're objective. We posted this. Now we can get back to promoting Sisi. But the fascinating thing here is that the response from private media was all so scandalized. How could they do this? So there's not even an attempt. There's not even an attempt to appear journalist as journalists.、Um, so yeah, I don't. It's 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 a very complex phenomenon, and it 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 needs thesis needs to be written on how the landscape has changed within a year. Like I. Like just when I was covering, like when during the revolution, I remember I was doing an interview on CNN, and I showed the headlines of several、uh, newspapers of Al Ahram. One before Mubarak stepped down, saying, you know, that millions are supporting Mubarak, and then like three days later, when he stepped down, you know, it was like, we won, we the people won, and it was kind of poking fun. And look how quickly they changed according to what the. But that's not even funny anymore because everyone does that, and it's it's not even surprising. You're like, yeah, yeah, that's that's the way it is. So it's not even something to point to as a mistake that media is doing because it's become so commonplace and it's become the norm. So under Morsi, you had his channels, right? Mustafa Twenty Five, Al Hafiz, and Nas. There were channels that were clearly, and they were also, by the way, just to also add this, they were extremely violent, and the rhetoric and the narrative came from them was so polarizing, and so.、Um, We have a word in Arabic, takfir, like you are literally saying that people who weren't following your mode of thought were infidels who were going to hell. So there was such ugliness being said on TV, and and also, so even then it was so accepted. You're like, how how is this even? You you have these people on TV who are preaching violence and who are preaching death to your fellow Egyptians, and it was totally accepted. So we can't actually say that this is bad, and they're all bad. Everyone is bad.、Um, So the only way, as a journalist, even when I, it's so much to stomach to sit and watch all this. But you just have to 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 watch across the board. You have to watch all the hosts from all the different ideologies. You have to read all the papers. You have to go on social media. You have to. This is the only way you get a kind of comprehensive image. But the reality is, no one actually does that except the journalists who are trying to cover. Because the people who are watching, they've become so desensitized and so exhausted from the talking, 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 talking.、Mm-hmm. It's all we've been doing for three years, by the way. Talking, talking, talk. Whether it's on TV or in your living room or with your families or with your friends, it's discussion, discussion, discussion. So people have become so tired of this. They only go to the host they like, who says the things they want to hear. So they can then quote him because he is a source of authority, regardless of wherever he gets his facts. Sometimes you will hear facts. You know, a thousand policemen have been killed. A thousand policemen have not been killed. Like two hundred of them, if that, during the last. But you'll hear these numbers being thrown, and they'll be taken as law, as as fact, as utter utter fact, and then reiterated to their own circle of friends or family. And that's how the cycle of misinformation and. It keeps being perpetuated because people don't actually want the truth. They just want to hear the things that make them sleep better at night. Because of things are so horrible, and they're tired of horrible things. It's why, for example, how last year in Rabah, the events of Rabah, when you had almost a thousand people killed. If you watch the reactions that day, I remember being、uh, just reading. 
it's almost as if people wanted to pretend it was a dream or it was something that didn't happen or that they weren't really humans or simply because they were so tired and because so much had already been lost if they had risen up again and said oh no this is bad but then what do we do and we're the ones who asked him to come and that's the narrative being being put right that's the national security and that's why CC is here so let's just pretend it didn't happen and this apathy is across the board and worse so with young people who actually participated in the revolution to begin with so many have lost hope have left the country who have now been from heroes and they're now in jail whether it's April 6th whether it's what and and people are just tired people want the whole media narrative now is being framed as the strong man the the the, pol- the the public safety and this is why we need to accept whatever happens because this is the only way we will go back to having safe country where i don't need to worry about my children being blown up in a mini you know how many times i hear of explosions like right next to my house and it's just become the norm they've discovered they keep discovering bombs everywhere and people just want things to go back to the way they were because we're all looking at the short term so in the short term if you if you actually just are just looking at the short term we're we're worse on every single criteria so a lot of people are it's true totally apathetic let's just switch off the television completely i have so many friends who don't even check the news anymore they're like we don't even want to know what's happening we're just going to get on with our lives and hopefully it'll just be fixed and if it's not i'm not going to do anything anymore because whatever we do it only makes it worse One thing we can say is that expectations are much lower now than they were for Morsi. Morsi came in no matter who had been in charge then they were going to fail because the expectations of Egyptians were sky high like we were expecting the world you were going to fix everything. Um so he had a much worse deal. Now everyone is so you know so depressed and things are so bad even if you give them a little bit of progress that's going to be amazing. So the situation then was that he Morsi was going to have this 100 day plan that was going to change everything right but everything went bad for him whether it was the subsidies the electricity all the same problems he had the media narrative then was spun as um well you know what he said he was going to fix everything and then you had the muslim brotherhood media saying well it's not a magic wand he's not he can't fix everything in a day and night he's not a he can't do all this the interesting thing now is that's now been flipped that this private media whenever we say what CC going to do they are the ones who are now saying well CC doesn't have a magic wand he's not going to fix everything in 100 well they don't actually say 100 days but they're not going to fix it overnight you have to be patient so the narrative back then was why isn't Morsi doing anything with only the muslim brotherhood press saying well you have to be patient but now everyone is saying you have to be patient so i actually think CC has a, a the situation is worse in the country than it was under Morsi but he has it better because the expectations are lower and because Egyptians have already put themselves in a position under Morsi they were waiting for him to prove himself all right we've put you in power now show us what you can do but it isn't that situation for CC with CC it's we're so grateful we're so happy that you've come to save us so we're just going to you know just sit here and wait to see what you're going to do for us and anything you do is good ay haga min andak like anything you do is is great which is a very different psychological perspective when you're waiting for someone to prove themselves you're challenging them versus when you're so grateful you'll accept crumbs so i think for a while cc can his popularity the cc mania of cupcakes and chocolates and all that that will last for a while in his charisma but I do believe that Egyptians aren't necessarily they're not going to rise up again if anything if if nothing materializes they're going to shut up but I think that on some levels CC will he will have to deliver because this is the way even something like reconciliation with the Muslim Brotherhood there has to be steps taken to legitimize his authority because it's all wonderful and amazing to have people's love and support but if there's nothing tangible you can't actually say that you've made the country better and we've we all know and they've been proven over and over again the army is not stupid the army isn't new at this the muslim brotherhood unfortunately they were not new and strangely not very naive or mursi was at least the army is not like that at all the army is very smart and clearly with their actions over the past year and a half they've shown that so 
I would say that just like with Morsi, we have to say, we have to wait and see. We gave Morsi a chance, he failed spectacularly, and regardless of how you look at Sisi or how you look at his actions, if we elect him, you have to give him a chance and see how it goes and then judge based on those actions. You never know. He could be the most amazing leader we've ever had. You never know. So I think women actually still do play the exact same role we played three years ago. Women still participate and still care as much in the political arena as they do. But unfortunately, the status of women when it comes to any of our rights have not progressed in any way. You even had under the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, calls that we should bring back the marriage age, bring it back down. Um, we should cancel the Khula law, which allows women to get a divorce. Thankfully, none of these things happen, but the, the importance of women issues has been put on a back burner. And that's because so many other things are happening in the country. So relatively speaking, it's like, oh, women, that's not important now because women's issues have never been considered important. We have so much more important things to worry about right now. Um, so I would say that, unfortunately, situation for women has not increased. Everything from sexual harassment to chances in the workplace, everything is the same, if not worse. Um, with, you know, a rising crime rate, so has sexual harassment, so has rape, so has anything to do with women. But women's commitment to still trying, whether it's in activism or joining the political sphere, is still the same. We're still struggling, just like every other Egyptian man or woman, we're still fighting. But everyone's tired and apathetic, as you said. Okay.